One, two. One, two. One, two. thought this morning. Isn't it a blessing to know God loves you? Amen. A lot of people might not, but he does. Amen. Let's stand while they come down. All the kids under 12, come with me. If you're on a bus kid, under 12, go right out this door right here, right now, right here. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, I don't know what your problem is this morning. I know I got a few, but uh, you know, I, I'm glad we can leave our troubles this morning in the Savior's hands and We'll sing a song, and uh, and I hope it'll be a blessing to you. Amen.
in the Savior's hand. There will be grace, grace to make it through this trial. There will be strength, strength to walk another mile. There will be hope when I've done all I can. I'm glad to know it's in the Savior's hands. Those hands have seen. In the Savior's hands, there will be grace, grace to make it through this trial. There will be strength, strength to walk another mile. There will be hope when I've done all I can. I'm glad to know it's in. to make it through this trial. There will be strength, strength to walk another mile. There will be hope when I've done all I can. I'm glad to know it's in the Savior's hands. I'm glad to in the Savior's hands. Amen. 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 All right, before you start the tape now, Brother Mike, let me talk just a second. What I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to talk a lot to the young people. And this is, of course, for every person, adults too. Well, I've been praying about this for a long time. And I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. For one time, all the kids, be real still. Don't talk and don't get up. Because what you're getting ready to hear this morning might be the most important uh, message some of y'all will hear outside of being a message on being saved. Might save you from a life of ruin. And I've been praying about this and announcing this. And so all you, all you teenagers listen real good to everything I'm going to say. And it's very important, and the adults too. Let's open our Bibles now uh, to the book of Proverbs. The book of wisdom is the book of Proverbs. We'll look at chapter 20. The book of Proverbs, chapter 20. Now, everybody's going to be still now. Don't get up. Everybody's going to be real still. Proverbs, chapter 20. We'll start there this morning. I'm going to give you a bunch of Bible references that I will not have time to show you or let you look up. So you might want to write them down or get this tape because I'm going to go over a whole lot of what the Bible says. Um, I'm preaching this morning on the subject of alcohol, public enemy number one. The Bible said in Proverbs chapter 20, look at verse 1. Proverbs 20 and verse 1. Somebody beside you don't have a Bible, uh, you look carefully. And I'd ask all you folks to pray there's people here this morning that need this real bad. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker, and strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Alcohol is a public enemy, number one. The Bible has a lot to say about alcohol. First of all, let me say that there's only two times in the Bible that alcohol is mentioned in any kind of positive light whatsoever. And you don't have time to turn to these, so just listen to me. The first one is 1 Timothy 5.23. Ever drunk in the United States knows that verse where it said, Use a little wine. 
for your stomach's sake. That's where it is recommended for medicine only, not as a beverage. That's the only time in the New Testament it's mentioned in a positive light. It's used in some medicine, and that would be the only good purpose for alcohol. Would it be used as a doctor prescribed in medicine, at NyQuil, things like that, that has a small percentage in it. And then the other one was in Deuteronomy 14, 26, where it's a prophecy of Jews going into the millennium, and the curse will be lifted then, and alcohol, the strong drink, won't have the curse on it that it has now. Every other time in the Bible that alcohol, strong drink, wine, liquor is mentioned in the Bible, it's mentioned in a very, very negative light. Now, there are two kinds of wine in the Bible. If you don't know this, uh, you don't need to listen to the people that said, well, they drunk wine in the Bible. Jesus drunk wine. Disciples drunk wine. Well, first of all, there's nowhere in the Bible where it says Jesus drank wine. I'll give anybody in here $1,000 if you can show me in the Bible where it says Jesus drank wine. And the wine in the Bible, you have to notice there are two kinds of wine in the Bible. There's what we call old wine, and that's fermented, and new wine, which is just grape juice squeezed right out of the grape. I can prove that. If you write it down, it's in Isaiah 65 and verse 8. The Bible said that new wine is found in the cluster. So what's hanging on a grapevine, where it's actually in that grape, squeeze it out, that's called new wine in the Bible. Old wine in the Bible is fermented wine. And fermented wine, the Bible said in Proverbs 23 and verse 31, that you are not supposed to even look at it after it's fermented. The Bible said it moveth itself. It is red and it moves itself aright. After it's fermented, you're not supposed to look at it, not supposed to touch it. So if Jesus made wine at the, at the wedding of Canaan and Galilee and they drunk it, I assume it was new wine. It just made it and they drunk it. And it was nothing but grape juice. And that's what the Bible described wine at. Even the old wine in the Bible has not near the potency and the, uh, the alcohol content that's what they sell on the shelf. So what they sell on the shelves down here and over there and at these stores is not even comparable to any wine that's mentioned in the Bible. And a person who don't know that don't know enough to even have an intellectual conversation about the subject. So I wouldn't listen to these people that go around saying, well, they drunk wine in the Bible. The wine they drunk in the Bible is not what they sell on the shelves over here and call wine. Just thought I'd mention that this morning. Now I want to say it's public enemy number one this morning and I do mean what I'm saying. I, I want to say first of all it's our public enemy number one first because of what it does to our homes. Nearly every home in here has been affected by alcohol or some have even been destroyed by it. Over 100,000 young men will have to start drinking this year to fill the shoes of those that have been ruined and killed by it. Which of your boys do you intend will stand in the footsteps and prints of evil men? I want to give you some stories this morning. All of these are true stories. Illustration number one. There's a young cotton mill worker that down in South Carolina. He had a sweet wife and a little baby. One day on a Saturday morning, he went to town and got drunk as he usually did on the weekend. His wife and little baby and their neighbor was sitting on the front porch uh, talking. It was a beautiful Saturday morning. He saw him, they saw him come up the, up the street. He was staggering. She said, you better leave. He's drunk. The neighbor left and went to her house. When he come up there, he was staggering around and he's beginning to cuss and, and scream curse words at his wife. She took the baby and ran in the house. He was fussing because supper wasn't ready. He came in and chased the wife through the house under the influence of our public enemy, number one. He picked up a piece of stove wood out the, out the hearth and hit his wife in the head, knocked her down, knocked the baby out of her hand. He picked up that little baby under the influence of the demon of drink and took a butcher knife and sawed that baby's head off of its body. They said that man's handprint was down in the head of that little bloody head of that little baby. They began to scream and, and they, the next day he was in jail. He sobered up and he couldn't believe what he had done. That's what they advertise on TV as cool and great and glamorous. Illustration number two. A 12 year old boy came home one day and found his drunk father trying to choke his mother. The young man grabbed a double barrel shotgun and loaded it and blew 
blew his daddy's brains out and scattered them on the floor. I know a young man that that happened to personally that I went to school with. Why don't they make a commercial out of that? Why don't they show that right in the halftime at the football game? Of oh, that young man, his daddy's blood and brains across the hall. Listen, they talk about drugs like that's the worst thing in the world, but for every drug addict we've got, we've got 10 alcoholics. And you say they put drugs on, on TV and they put, talk about say no to drugs, say no to drugs, and all of that's bad and wicked, and I preach about all of that. But I'm going to tell you something. You know why they don't talk about alcohol on TV? Because the government gets the money from alcohol and the pusher gets the money off of drugs. And ladies and gentlemen, it's a scourge that's ruining our world today. Illustration number three. A man has been drunk several days. He's fussing and cussing with his family. He picks up the baby of the family, slings it through a plate glass window. You say, how could a man do something like that? Under the influence of alcohol. It's all the mom could stand. She grabbed a pistol and shot him six times. He lay there in the floor lifeless as a result of our public enemy number one. Illustration number four. There's a businessman who drank heavily. It takes years for alcohol to get you. First time cocaine, you're an addict. First time meth, you're an addict. But you know why alcohol's worse? Because little by little you think it ain't bothering you. Little by little you do it every weekend. And the first thing you know, it's got its claws wrapped around your life in such a way that you can't never, ever, ever get loose. And that man begins to, uh, he began to cuss and, and, uh, and they died in delirium tremors and a nurse standing by his bedside she said I never ever want to see a man die uh, who's been under the influence of alcohol she said he was screaming she said he said his bed was full of snakes and the devil was coming in his room his eyes turned green and then he died and went into eternity into hell uh, most of the time if a man of the house drinks his son will drink and or his kids will drink. Kids do in excess what their parents do in moderation. And a man that says uh, uh, that he can take it or leave it will take it every chance he get. They said there was a distinguished colonel at a general a general at a meeting one time and at a big dinner and they come around and they were serving everybody wine. They offered him a glass and he said no thank you. And the lady was there in charge. She said I can't believe that. You're a famous man. You're a great man. Why would you turn it down? And the general looked and he said you see that boy right there? He said, that's my son. He said, if I turn it down, maybe my son will turn it down also. The same thing happened. Uh with uh, Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth, the great baseball player, had a lot more sense and morals than these guys do now. They asked Babe Ruth one time. They said, will you make a commercial? You can, we'll pay you a lot of money. And he said, all you have to do is advertise beer. And Babe Ruth said, there's thousands of little boys in this nation that admire me. He said, they want to grow up to be just like me. He said, I don't want their blood on my hand. And he turned them down. Listen, it's sorry bunch of football players and baseball players that don't even and care about your sons and your daughters. They know what that stuff does to people. They know how it ruins lives. They know how it fills graves. They ought to be ashamed of their self for advertising something that's the worst scourge on our country today. Amen. I, there's a put out, uh, they said uh, Abraham Lincoln turned it down too. And they tried to get Abraham Lincoln to drink one time and a colonel tried to get him, or a, a politician said, and Abraham said, I never touched the stuff. And they said, why, Mr. Lincoln? And he said, when I was little, my mama made me promise her that I would never put alcohol to my lips. And he said, I've kept that promise, and I've made them glad. I'm glad that I did. And that politician said, I'd give a thousand dollars if I'd made my mama a promise like that. He said, it's got me. They made a song called, Don't Let the Good Life Pass You By. They made a song called, Have You Ever Saw the Funny Side of Boozing? That's how they get you kids. They make you think it's it's funny. Ha, ha, ha. So and so went out the other night and got drunk. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Uh, you know, I heard they went out and boy, she puked in the back seat and we almost got caught and we had to go clean up the car. Kids think it's funny. You know why? They're not very smart in their head. Uh, let me give you an illustration. Crash! Bang! A car accident. There's a little girl been hit. The driver staggers out of the car holding an empty liquor bottle, rolls out on the pavement. Ambulances and sirens come around. The little girl is crippled for life. Isn't that funny? Why ain't you laughing? 
A mother and children, illustration number six. Look and look out the window. In a little village, they wait and wait on daddy to come home. It's payday and they had no groceries all week. And as they're waiting on daddy to come home and the little kid's stomach is hurting. And daddy don't come home at five. And daddy don't come home at six. And daddy don't come home at seven. And daddy don't come home at eight. And it's dark. And daddy finally staggers in. He don't have no groceries. He don't have no money. His money's down at the tavern somewhere. He like, Isn't that the most hilarious thing you've ever heard of? How funny that is. Isn't that cute? Or those little kids go to sleep with no groceries on the table because of daddy's alcohol problem. Illustration number seven. We're in a hospital room now. A young lady is screaming, and she's screaming out of her mind. Her alcohol has made her go crazy. You say, preacher, that'll never happen to me. That's what they all said. Every one of them said it'll never happen to me. Every one of them said, listen, every drunk in the world started off with one drink, with one little bit. Let's go on this morning. First a man takes a drink. Then the drink takes a drink. Then the drink takes a man. You say a little bit won't hurt? After one beer, if you drink one beer, ladies and gentlemen, you already lose 5% of your memory capacity. One ounce of alcohol. I brought that to show you this morning. I'm going to show you this this morning. I have here in this baby bottle here this morning, that is one ounce of water. You see that right there? That is one ounce of water. That's barely enough just to wet your mouth. That is one ounce. You could take that down. You couldn't even swallow an aspirin with that much. After that much alcohol, alcohol enters into your bloodstream, you lose 10% of your ability to react or it slows your down, down like putting on brakes or like turning or stopping or, or, or avoid an accident. 10% after that much. I'd say if you drunk twice that much right there, you might lose 20 or 30% of your ability to think quick or react. Don't you believe it for one? And that's not it ounce of alcohol. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a curse because of what it's done to our homes. Are you listening to me? Uh, those who sell it are crooked as a dog's hind leg. Anybody that sell you alcohol is so crooked they have to screw their socks on in the morning. If they fell in a barrel of fish hooks, they wouldn't get stuck all the way to the bottom. Amen? And you can tell them I said so too. Uh, the Bible said in Habakkuk 2 and verse 15, whoa! Woe to him that puts the bottle, giveth his neighbor drink, that puts the bottle to him. I'm telling you this morning, it's a terrible, terrible thing. Think of how many have been ruined and lose all their self-respect. Girls, young girls. You've seen young girls get, that's the saddest, most pitiful thing in the world is a young lady who is beautiful and already got drunk. Girls' eyes are not bright anymore. They're red and sunk in. Their hair is not beautiful. It's stringy and dirty and out of place. Their beautiful lips are not producing smiles, but blasphemy, cursing, and oaths against God and threats. It'll turn a fine, smart young man into a spewing, spittering, sputtering, slobbering, staggering, stammering, stringy-headed, bleary-eyed, red-faced, raving, craving, maniac, drunk. I've seen them over here in Broughton Hospital where alcohol had a hold of them, and brother, you'd never know that there's ever a normal person. I say it's possible public enemy number one because of what it does to our homes and it fills up the divorce court. You ask this man right here, he's a policeman, he sat in the courtroom all week. Uh, if you go up there and sit in any courtroom in the country, if they have 10 cases on Monday morning, six or seven of them are because of alcohol, one way or another. I've got other statistics to give you in just a minute, if you'll listen carefully. I want to say secondly this morning, it's our public enemy number one because of what it does to our heart. What it does to our heart. The Bible said wine takes away your heart. Young girls, listen to you. All you young girls, listen to me this, this morning. Why do you think boys want you to drink? I mean, why do you think? Well, they say, come on, we'll buy you some if you'll drink. You know why a boy wants a girl to drink? 
Same reason a boy wants a girl to smoke pot. The same reason, because if a girl gets drunk, she'll do whatever else, then it's sooner or later. I've had boys tell me, they said, Brother Danny, if you can get a girl to drink, you can get her to have sex. And a young girl will lose her virginity and a lot of times not even make a rational decision because of that. You might as well say amen. That's what the Bible said. The Bible said in Habakkuk 2 and verse 15 that when a person gives you alcohol, they are doing it that they can look on your nakedness. What it said. That's what the Bible said, brother. God said that, people. You can't get around what God said. God Almighty said when somebody gives you alcohol, they're doing it so they can look at your naked body and it's to break down your resistance. That's why it's a popular spring break. That's the biggest bunch of hell this world's ever seen. That's some of these places like Daytona and all these places where young people think it's all right. It's not all right. It's all wrong. It's a sin against God. God, and woe unto him that puts a bottle to his neighbor's lips. It would never do, you'd do things you'd never do sober. Amen. The Bible said in Proverbs, it'll make you behold strange women. You young men in here, when you get drunk, that's all you want to do is behold strange women. That's why in the bars and clubs at two and three o'clock in the morning, everybody winds up going home with somebody because it'll make you behold strange women. No one can stand to be around you. You know, there ain't nobody can stand to be around a drunk but another drunk. Amen. That's why when somebody gets drunk, they want everybody to drink with them because you can't stand to be around just one person drinking. It's so sickening. It's so disgusting. It smells so bad. Nothing in the world stinks worse than alcohol and sweat and underarm after about three days when people's tried to cover it up with cologne and mouthwash. That's the most sickening smell on this earth, brother. Dead dog smells better than that. I'm telling you this morning, brother, it, it, nobody can stand to be around you. I, I mean, You've heard me say one evening in October when I was far from sober, I was carrying home a load with manly pride. My feet began to stutter, so I lay down in the gutter, and a pig came up and lay right down by my side. I said, it's fair weather when good fellers get together till a lady passing by was heard to say, you can tell a man who boozes by the company that he chooses. And the pig got up and slowly walked away. <laughs> Amen. I mean, a pig can't even stand to be around you. That's right, brother. A pig can't even stand to be around you. That's what old man said one time. Uh, he said when they gave out brains, I thought they said trains, and I miss mine. He said when they gave out looks, I thought they said books, and I said I don't want any. He said when they gave out noses, I thought they said roses, and said make mine a big red one. He said uh, when they gave out chins, I thought they said gin. I said give me a double. He said ain't I a mess? That's right, brother. That's what it'll do to you. It's caused rape. It's caused incest. In Genesis 19, the first case of incest in the Bible was caused by alcohol. And I'm telling you what, brother, alcohol caused the first case of incest where the Lot's daughters had sex with her father and became pregnant by him. The first time a man got drunk was Genesis 9 in the Bible after the flood, before the flood, the curse wasn't there, but after the flood in Genesis 9, the first time a man got drunk was Noah after the flood and then Ham, his son, come in. You know, sin it was there. Many people believe the first act of homosexuality was committed in Genesis 9 because Noah woke and knew what his younger son had done to him, connected with alcohol. It's connected with nakedness. It's connected with dancing. It's connected with incest, homosexuality, all the way through the Bible. And the Bible tells us what's right. It robs you of reason as it did Nabal in 1 Samuel 25 and verse 36. It's a, it's a curse on this world because of what it does to our hearts. Thirdly this morning, I want to say it's public enemy number one because of what it's done on our highways. Because of what it's done on our highways, it impairs your judgment. That's why they call it DWI, driving while impaired. It means your ear, you're not able to think straight or right. It impairs your judgment. Movie stars make you think it's cool. They put girls on TV like Britney Spears, Paris Hilton, Nicole Richie, driving up the wrong side of the interstate under the influence. Paris Hilton just told them she had one beer. Uh, she's so skinny, one beer would make her drunk. And I'll tell you something, brother. Listen, I'll tell you what. Brother, they, they put it on there and make you kids think everybody does it. They make you young people think 
It's cool. Everybody's doing it. You're oddball. You're a weirdo. And young people make. If I don't drink, all my friends are going to think I'm weird. If I don't think, if I don't drink, I got a story to tell you about that tonight. You be back tonight. I, I got a story to tell you about that right there. But the police's number one problem is alcohol. Almost 60% of highway fatalities occur on weekends, and 60% of them are alcohol related. And brother, there's like a, I've got how many? Something like 80,000 people per year killed and, 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 and all kinds of alcohol related in, in, uh, incidents. And if you had 100 people lined up here that got killed on the highway last year, nearly 60 of them would still be alive if it wasn't for alcohol. Six out of 10. Six out of 10. If that was anything else, they'd outlaw it in a minute. And the reason to outlaw it ain't outlawed is because the government gets the money. And that's why you see commercials on TV. Sit down now, everybody, stay down. That's why you see commercials that say, that say uh, don't do drugs, say no to drugs, say no to drugs. And I'm all for that. I believe that 100%. They, don't, they even say, don't let your, talk to your children about smoking. Talk to your children about smoking. My foot. Talk to your kids about drinking. I mean, tell them like Jack Howell's mama said, alcohol's bad, liquor's bad, wine is bad. Tell them. Get your kids down and tell them it's wrong. I told my girls, don't ever let it touch your mouth. Don't ever let it touch your mouth. Don't ever let it touch your mouth. You have 100% change positively. You can never become an alcoholic if you never take a drink. Amen. 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 We spend more money cleaning up the mess they make than you make off of it. We spent eight, $8 billion for alcohol last year and only $5 billion on public education. The criminal justice system, uh, uh, the motor vehicle accidents, the health and medical treatments, the treatments of chronic alcoholics, lost production, social welfare, welfare programs, and on and on and on. For every dollar we take in, we spend two dollars and a half cleaning up the mess. It is not profitable for our country. It is a scourge. Alcohol has drained more blood, dug more graves, sold more homes, plunged more people into bankruptcy, slain more children, snapped more wedding bands, defiled more innocence, dethroned more reason, blinded more eyes, wrecked more mankind, dishonored more women, womanhood, broken more hearts, ruined more lives, sold more women, drove more to suicide, took more to hell than any other death-dealing scourge that's ever swapped across this country this morning. I'm telling you, it's public enemy number one because of what it does on our highways. You say it don't hurt a little bit. Listen, if I was going to get on an airplane, I wouldn't, would you want to get on an airplane with a pilot that had been drinking? If I was going to have surgery, would you want a hot doctor doing surgery on you that's been drinking? Oh, sir, you know good and well. You're just trying to make excuses. You say just a little bit. You say you can handle it. Man that says, I'll take it or leave it, will take it every chance he gets. You can't handle it. Nobody ever could handle it. It's like trying to handle a double-headed copper a head and a rattlesnake. I'm telling you, you can't handle it. You say it don't hurt. It sure does. I'm telling you this, this morning because of what it's done on our highways. Fourthly, this morning, I want to say it's public enemy number one because of what it's done to heaven and hell. I see God's already getting a hold of a lot of you this morning. You listen carefully for the next few minutes. It's kept many from heaven and helped populate hell more than any dealing scourge to sweep across this country. I heard somebody on TV the other day, man said, I'm an alcoholic. It's a disease. That's a lie. It is not a disease. Now, it's a major problem. Ain't no doubt. Can you turn me up on this just a little bit, brother? It's a major problem. I'll prove to you it's not a disease. You say, well, I can't help it. Yes, you can. Put you in jail for about three weeks. Lock your, you watch you quit drinking. You can quit. You just don't want to. You ain't man enough or woman enough to say, no, it's ruining my life. I'm going to stop right here today. You say, I can't stop. Well, if it's a disease, it's the only disease you catch on purpose. If it's a disease, it's the only disease you can buy in a bottle. If it is a disease, it's the only disease that the regular outlets they have to sell it. If it is a disease, it's the only disease that produces revenue for the government. If it is a disease, it's the only disease that causes crime and rape. Yeah, that's right. okay. Cancer don't cause you people to get raped and crime and incest. If it is a disease, it's the only one that is habit forming. If it is a disease, it's the only disease spread by advertising. If it is a disease, it's the only disease caught uh, with, without a germ or a virus and there's no medicine to treat it. 
If it is a disease, it's the only disease that run, that run, run uh, people apart and cause you to dance and brag about in a nightclub somewhere. And if it is a disease, it's the only disease that'll keep you out of heaven. You don't go to hell cause you got a disease. It's not a disease, it's a sin. It's a sin. Amen. And the reason you don't quit, you just ain't got, God ain't got a hold of you just right. You listening? A man and a woman and a little child come around a curb one evening and she come around a curb like this and when she come around this curb she looked and there was something laying in the road and she got, she saw it was a deer. She pulled over like this and rolled down her window and saw it was a young man. And this young man was laying there. She could see he was jay, uh, shaking and jerking his body was and she stopped and got out. Young man started out just like some of you young men here this morning. She got out of the car and took her little, took her little, uh, little girl by the hand, about two years old, and went over there and there was that man laying there jerking around in the middle of the road. She said, Son, what's wrong? And that boy began to scream. He said, don't, don't let my daddy find out. Don't let my daddy find out. I don't want daddy to see me like this. He was so drunk he couldn't even stand up and throw it up. And so she began to try to help that man out of the road. And as she did, a car come around the curve, right sideways, and it's a dirt road, real fast, and she saw it was coming. She couldn't do nothing except grab her child and get out of the way. So she grabbed her child and moved like this, and that car come over him and run over him like that, and the bottom bar of that car got him and drug him on up the, uh, half, a, uh, half a block up, up the road here, and it killed him just like that. And the last thing he ever said was, don't let my daddy see me like this. That boy's daddy was a preacher. You say, preacher, that never happened to me. We just go down to Hickory on Saturday nights and, and we just some of them get some beer and we can handle it. That'll never happen to us. We just go to the bar and sit around. Remember that little shot I showed you a while ago? You listen to what I'm getting ready to say. A bar. Where'd it get a name like that? A bar to heaven. A door to hell. Whoever named it. Named it well. A bar to manliness and wealth. A door to want and broken health. Yeah. A bar to honor, pride and fame. A door to grief, sin and shame. Yeah. A bar to hope. A bar to prayer. A door to darkness and despair. A bar to honored, useful life. A door to a brawling, senseless strife. A bar to all that's true and brave. A door to ever drunkard's grave. A bar to joys that home imparts, a door to tears and aching hearts. A bar to heaven, a door to hell. Whoever named it, named it well. Yep. I've saw my daddy lose his job. See, he started out when he was a young man, 25, 30, 35, just taking a little sip every now and then. Takes it 15 years to get you. If you just drank a little bit. And I saw him laying in the bed, passed out. And I remember going in his bedroom and putting my hand on my daddy's heel and said, God, don't let daddy die. I can't stand the thoughts of my daddy burning in hell. Don't let him die. And daddy, those four, they voted him in and marrying. So them idiots up there said, if you vote liquor and wine in, people won't drink as much. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. Amen. That's like saying, if you fill this, this table full of candy here and just let the kids have all they want, they'll eat less candy. That's wicked, wicked. And I saw my daddy lose his job. You ever saw your mama scared to death? They might drop a cigarette and burn the house down and mama crying. Amen. You ever had to live around it like that? I got some stories to tell you tonight. I loaded up my van. My daddy would be so drunk he didn't even know what he had in the house and staggered through the house and I've stacked packs of beer this high in the back of my van and the back of my van said, Jesus is coming soon, repent, in letters that big. Well, he used to preach on the street all the time and I'd back it up there to the, to the bootlegger in, in between Nebo and Marion and scared him out of his wits. 
and I backed it up to the back door, and I'd stand there, and that thing had Jesus coming soon. I'd open it back, and it'd be stacked that high of beer. And I said, I'm going to this off my daddy's bill. Yes, Danny. Yes, Danny. Yes, sir. He started carrying that stuff in there, and I watched him mark it off daddy's bill. He was scared to death of me. Proud turn. He's a bootlegger. You think I don't hate it? You think I've not seen over the years, pastor, in 30 years nearly, you think I haven't seen what it's done to thousands and thousands? You young people have no idea what you're messing with. You have no idea how bad it is. You have no idea how powerful it is. You say, well, Brother Danny, I go to other churches and that preacher never says, you know why that preacher don't say nothing about it? Because there's people sitting in his church that keeps wine in the refrigerator and he's afraid if he says anything, he'll offend them and they'll quit giving their money. Listen, I, you ain't scaring me one bit. I ain't scared of nobody in here. I'm going to tell you what this Bible said. It's wrong. I don't care who does it. It's sin against God. Amen. So I'll take my money. You help yourself. And I'll stand before God one day with clean hands saying, God, I told them. Yes, Preachers is scared to preach on it because some idiot told them Jesus and the disciples drunk wine. Because of what it's done to heaven and hell. You think about all the young people that went out partying one night. I've seen them. I've come up on car wrecks. I'll say this and I'm going to be through. Several years ago, this is a true story. There was a car accident involving several young people. Listen, boys. Several young people. There was two or three killed. One girl, a teenage girl, who was under 17, was killed in that car wreck. Was killed in that car wreck. Her daddy was a prominent businessman in the community. The phone calls were made. All the community was out there. It was a tragic accident. It happens in every little old small town in America. And there was blood and bodies laying on the highway. And that young girl's body was laying there. They called the daddy. The daddy come down there in a rage. He said, what happened? They said he was drunk. They said the boy was driving was drunk. Had a, a half a bottle of wine and they was all drinking wine. He said they was all drunk. And he said, he said, my daughter drinking? He said, yes, it was. He said, I'll kill the man that gave my daughter wine. He said, I'll kill him. You tell me where they got it. They're underage. They ain't got no business drinking. You tell me where they got it. I'll kill the man. That gave my daughter wine. They cleaned him up and took him down to the hospital, or took him down to the morgue and was going to make preparation at the bottom. That night he went home. He went home in a big, fine, fancy house. He said, I can't stand it. I'm going to get me a drink. It's calmed my nerves. And he opened up his wine cabinet and there was a note. And it said, Dear Dad, we're taking along some of your wine. I knew you wouldn't mind. Love's on his daughter. Oh, the tears that have been shed. Oh, the dear ladies that have sat up in the middle of the night and prayed, God, get a hold of my boy. God, get a hold of my husband. A bar to heaven, a door to hell. Whoever named it, named it well. It's public enemy number one because of what it's done to our homes, on our highways, to our hearts, to heaven and hell. I want you to stand please and bow your head. Every head bowed, nobody's talking, nobody's moving. Don't move, bow your head, close your eyes.